This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. This chapter looks at the audit of receivables. Uh, receivables in anything really but a cash business are liable to be very material amounts. And there are also amounts which uh, require some care at valuing. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, although you and I, no doubt, always pay our debts, uh, some people don't. And there are companies which go into li- liquidation, which fail, uh, and who will never pay the amounts they owe. It is really universal practice to carry out what is called a receivables or, or debtors circularization. This is where you write to uh, customers, debtors, asking them to confirm what they owe to your client. Again, it will tend to be done on a a, a sample basis. And very often, as it says third from the bottom here, uh, we'll use stratification. We may be right to the 10 very biggest customers with the biggest balances. We may be right to 50% of the medium-sized balances and then maybe we write to 50 uh, out of the <coughs> several hundred of the small balances. So we cover by value a good proportion of the total receivables balance. There are two types of uh, um, circularization, positive and negative. Uh, a positive circularization is where you want the customer to reply Uh, whether or not they agree with the balance. Uh, So if they agree with the balance, they will just sign uh, the the letter, post it back, saying we agree. If they don't agree with the balance, they will say what balance they have. Uh, And any differences, apart from any errors, any differences you hope can be explained by timing differences. Maybe on the last day of the year, you sent an invoice to that customer, which a customer hadn't received yet at the end of the year, so is his shows is owing a smaller amount, or maybe in the last day of the year, the the customer was thought they'd paid you, transferred some money to you, but I hadn't got into your books yet. So most of the differences can be explained by timing differences. Other differences are probably due to an error, either by your client or by their customer. Negative circularization. Uh, what you're saying there to the uh, clients, customers, is only reply if you don't agree. And these are almost useless uh, because uh, not everybody replies to these letters anyhow. There's no legal obligation to bother filling in and looking it up and so on. Uh, some people can't fill it in because they simply don't keep permanent records of what they owed several months ago. There's no real need to do that. Uh, so if you don't get letters coming back from your clients, customers, you don't know uh, whether it is because they agree or whether it is simply because they can't be bothered finding out why they agree, whether or not they agree. So negative circularizations are not really very good audit evidence. The uh, circularization letter is written on client note paper because there's a kind of confidentiality uh, business relationship, if you like, between your client and their customer, uh, and you can't just have auditors writing to, to, to people out of the blue saying, what did you owe this person at the end of the year? So the letter is written on client's note paper. It's addressed to these various customers, asks them to confirm or otherwise the amount they owed at a particular date. And what is normal is to supply with it a stamped addressed envelope, which sends a reply directly back to the auditor's office. Remember when we were looking at the strength of evidence, uh, we said auditor direct obtained is much better than via the client. If these letters came into the client, the client could look at them and say, well, that one agrees, that's one for the auditor, this one doesn't agree, Ooh, just throw it away. So you want to hear the good news and the bad news directly from the client's customers, so replies go directly to the auditor's offices. As well as asking about the big debts, you should uh, ask about uh, slightly odd amounts. You should ask about very old debts to see if you get any sort of reply there. You should ask about credit balances because by and large, you don't really expect credit balances on a receivables ledger. It implies something 
something slightly odd has gone on in the past. Not necessarily fraud, not necessarily wrong, but it's quite nice to know uh, how it's come about. Circularizations uh, uh, need to be set up quite early after year end. If you're doing one at year end, so you can actually verify the year end balance, certain aspects of the year end balance. Uh, you want to get your letters out pretty quickly. You want to get them out maybe within a week uh, because it'll take a while for them to get to the client's customers, to get the right people in the client's customers accounting department, to get them to deal with it, for them to send it back and you also want uh, time to follow up. You want to follow up either non-replies. You know, if it's a very big balance and this person hasn't replied to you, again, it might be because they can't be bothered, uh, but you want maybe to be able to send them a second letter to, to encourage them, to remind them. And you also want to leave time to follow up any discrepancies which there are uh, and which need to be explained. So receivable circularization. Uh, as I say, universal, fantastically important, is very, very good evidence. It's third-party evidence. It's coming from the client's customers. It is written evidence. It is directly received by the auditor. It's got a lot of good stuff going for it. What else do we do uh, to verify our uh, uh, receivables? And uh, this is really a list of uh, pretty much what you, what you do. First of all, you reconcile, must reconcile, and really before you do the circularization, you reconcile the receivables control account to the sum of the individual balances. Uh, and why would you do that? Uh, and, and, and it's the auditor who has to do this kind of reconciliation. Why, why do we do this rather boring business of just adding up maybe a thousand receivables accounts and making sure they agree to the control account. Well, really the reason is that the receivables balance that appears in the current assets doesn't actually exist. The receivables balance is actually all the little individual balances. The total doesn't exist as a single entity or asset. It, it's only there because of these little individual balances. So we have to make sure that the total that's appearing in the current assets is actually made up, is constructed properly of these little individual balances, the separate balances on each customer's account. Another reason you have to, to, to think about it, let's say there were a thousand customers and the uh, a uh, client hands you this great big computer printer, a thousand pages in it, one for each customer, and a total at the end, which is the receivables balance is going to be in the financial statements. Let's say the total of the receivables balance comes to a million. And within this uh, 1,000 customers, one of them owes 200,000. But uh, the uh, client knows that this 200,000, there's a risk it won't be paid. It's going to be a bad debt, and obviously writing down receivables of a million down to receivables of 800,000 uh, is going to be an extra expense of uh, 200,000, and maybe the client doesn't want that. So what the client does in this 1,000 pages is you tear out the one uh, that is the 200,000 from this client who's in some difficulty and gives you 999 balances toward it which you think adds up to the million uh, and it doesn't matter you could circularize all of these people and you'd never ever circularize the missing one it, the, the this missing one has got no chance of being selected in any sort of stratification or random selection so you need to make sure that the what you're working with to verify this one million, this total balance, is actually something which is going to reconcile to that one million. So you have to add it up. Age listings, invoices 30 days old, 60 days old, 90 days old and so on, terribly important in uh, the valuation of the receivables. By and large, you probably put in 100% all receivables up to 60 or even maybe 90 days. Uh, after receivables gone on 90 days, 
you begin to worry more and more and more about it. Am I ever going to receive it? Once you do uh, 60, 90, 120 days, you may be given up all hope. And quite often people arrange their general allowance for bad debts at certain percentages. So 4% of all debts up to 60 days old, uh, then maybe 5% of debts between 60 and 90 days old, maybe 10% of debts uh, over the, the 90 days. And we can't just take the client's word that the aged uh, listing, the aged analysis has been done properly. They could be subtly moving things you know, to be a bit closer, so it looks as though the debts haven't been outstanding as long and look a bit healthier than they really are. You look at correspondence with customers. <coughs> if a customer is not paying, we'll write to them. First of all, we telephone them, but eventually we'll write to them. And they might say, well, we're not paying, uh, because uh, the goods you supplied were of inferior quality and we want an allowance. And there's going to be a bit of really argument about whether or not uh, there is going to be an allowance for the inferior goods. So they might say, we never got the goods, we're not going to pay the invoice. And if, and if people are complaining about goods that, or, or, or denying that they ever received the goods, Presumably there's going to be a chance that at some point you may write down the receivable. You might write it off and say, well, maybe, you know, we, they got lost in transit and maybe the goods were really of inferior quality. So correspondence with your customers can give some insights into how happy and how those customers are and how likely it is that the debt will be paid. Board minutes, important to scrutinise those because any large debt that the board is worried about should be discussed. The board should be discussing all large material transactions uh, and a major customer on the verge of liquidation you'd expect to see talked about at the board. Collection period, uh, work out the collection period, the days uh, of uh, receivables. You do that by taking the receivables balance and dividing by the sales per day. So if one year it is 40 days, the next year in 90 days, you usually get worried. Uh, why are they not collecting these debts? Uh, are they sending out incorrect invoices? Has their credit control department fallen to bits? Is it that the uh, economic recession is so bad that all of these customers of our clients are in trouble and maybe the debts will never be repaid? Receipts after year end is a fantastic uh, test if you can wait. Uh, so if there's 20,000 outstanding at year end from a customer that you're worried about, and then on the 20th of January, that customer pays you 20,000, well, you know it was right to value it at 20,000 at year end. It, it's, it's a debt that is proven to be a good debt. It's not going to be written down. Uh, obviously, some people might take a while, uh, but sometimes people delay uh, signing the audit report, they're waiting on a really major customer paying, they wait to the end of January, wait to the end of February, try to drag their heels really uh, to see if they get some more evidence that the debt is actually going to be honoured. And finally, uh, scrutinised credit notes issued just after year end. What we're worried about here, what you can be worried about here, uh, look at a company that wants to boost its sales, so what it does in uh, 20th of December, it debits 100,000 to receivables, credits 100,000 to uh, sales, never actually sends the invoice out to anybody. It might even be a false customer who's been set up. And then uh, just after year end, what you do is you issue a credit note uh, to that customer again, debiting sales and basically reversing out the debt from the customer's account. And if there are major credit notes issued, uh, really within about the first month, you want to make sure that these are not being issued to, to cover up false invoices that were issued just before year end. Now this list might look fairly comprehensive, uh, but in fact the, the number of substantive tests that can be done <coughs> is, is almost endless. And certainly other ones that will be done here is what uh, I will, uh, for, for the sake of argument to start with, to put something down on the on the list here, I will call tracing.
Now, what do I mean by tracing? Because it, it means nothing on its own. You have to explain. You would have to explain exactly what what the test was. And what it's really saying is, when you come across a receivable at year end that's made up of invoices, invoices which have been, uh, we hope, legit legitimately issued uh, because of orders. So going through the, the old sales process, uh, an order would have been received from the customer, the dispatch would have been made to the customer, you would raise an invoice, uh, post that to the customer, and you would debit the customer's account. That's how that little part of the receivable was created. So what you should be able to do with a balance uh, outstanding at year end, so for several of your customers, is to find out what, what invoices make up the, the, those balances and then to trace those back, probably on a, on a test basis, on a, a sample basis, test those back uh, to the underlying causes of the transaction. So if somebody owed you 5,000 and that was made up of two invoices, 3,000 and 2,000, well, go and get the invoices, see that they were legitimate invoices because that's why there's a legitimate receivable. For those two invoices, you would trace that back. Can I see the dispatch notes? Here they are. Uh, and then can I see the uh, orders which caused those dispatch notes, which caused the orders which caused the uh, receivable? We should also be able to, uh, to trace the receipt of amounts just before year end, because if a receivable, it doesn't appear, if you like, at year end, uh, an invoice has been sent out to the customer and has been paid by the customer. So we would also look at some of the credit entries in customers' accounts, cash coming in, and tracing that to the cash book. Yes, this is cash which has actually come in, uh, and we can see maybe remittance advices, correspondence from the customer saying, these are the invoices we, we are paying. So this uh, tracing uh, of, of detail, really, uh, is very important. We can do this in all, nearly all of the balances which we have. Detailed uh, examination of what makes up the year-end balance, uh, what transactions were properly underlying that. Don't just use the word tracing in an exam. Say exactly what you're tracing and why you're tracing it. So, so tracing uh, the back to the invoices, back to the dispatch notes, back to the purchase orders, is telling you something, yes, the uh, uh, amount exists, it is ours, uh, it uh, is been cut off properly, in other words, it be belongs to a particular year which we have. Uh, and uh, you could trace the other way, you could trace from a great big book of invoices uh, and make sure these invoices are going to the debits of the uh, customers' accounts. And that would help you with completeness. There's no point in having an invoice in the file which has never got on to the receivables ledger because then you would be understating the assertion of a completeness. Now, this means that substantive tests are divided into two uh, sorts. You'll come across these terms. First of all, there are, uh, is analytical review. And we had analytical review here. Basically, that was looking at the collection period, we, we did a, a, a ratio there. Uh, we could also do analytical reviews maybe on uh, discounts that were given to customers and so on. They would be kind of related to receivables. Uh, and then we have tests of detail. Tests of detail is getting down to very detailed, almost single transactions, single entries in the ledger, uh, making sure that there's a, if you like, a complete chain which, which is supporting these entries in the ledger. And a lot of the rest of what we're looking at here is a, is, is a test of detail. An age listing is a test of detail because you're getting down to very uh, detailed figures and, and so on. Receipts after year end is essentially a test of detail uh, because it's telling us which of these debts outstanding at year end is going to be, um, uh, you know, is a good debt, is, is, not, is, is eventually paid. So remember, analytical review and tests of detail, the two types of substantive tests.